Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cooperative Models for Digital Archives. My name is Emily Zinger, and my fellow panelists and I all have the similar position of working for shared digital archives. These archives are governed, funded, contributed to, and managed by multi-institutional consortia. This cooperative model of work has its benefits and its challenges. And today, we're going to share with you some of our own experiences from working within these models. If you have a question at any time, please submit it through the chat and we'll answer you as best we can. We will not be conducting a live Q&A for this session. Before we begin, I'd like to share a land acknowledgement from the place where I am located, Ithaca, New York. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayokono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayokono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gayokono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayokono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Now let me introduce myself and my co-panelists. Again, I'm Emily Zinger, Project Manager for the Southeast Asia Digital Library, and I'm headquartered at Cornell University. Shawnee Yvette Moraine is Director of Community Engagement for the Digital Public Library of America, and she has recently been the force behind DPLA's Black Women's Suffrage Collection. Emma Thompson is Project Manager for the Digital Scriptorium and is based at University of Pennsylvania. And Neil Agrawal is project manager for the South Asia Open Archives, an initiative of the Center for Research Libraries. Hello, colleagues. Um, again, my name is Neil Agrawal, and it's a pleasure to be here today. For our presentation, we'll cover a variety of areas, including one, case studies, uh, providing a brief introduction to our collaborative projects, two, governance highlighting our unique governance structures. Three, resource sharing, which is a critical component of successful and diverse digital projects. Four, funding structures for maintaining short and long-term sustainability. And five, quality assurance to ensure a standardized work product. We will reserve some time to address your questions at the end of our presentation. The Southeast Asia Digital Library, or CEDL, S-E-A-D-L, is a free and open access repository of resources from and about Southeast Asia. The project began in 2006 with a grant from the Department of Education, and CEDL now holds over 9,000 items, including monographs, oral histories, manuscripts, and more. The library is hosted by Northern Illinois University, and cooperatively managed by a consortium of 16 other institutions in the United States that all have Southeast Asia physical collections. CEDL primarily seeks to serve uh, research support in Southeast Asian studies, but also seeks to connect with users who are interested in their own cultural heritage. This is a really exciting time for CEDL. My role as project manager is newly created and I've been in it for just over a year now. The project recently received a significant grant from the Henry Luce Foundation with a focus on sustainable growth. And so we're drafting new policies, we're generating new workflows for communication, and we're completely redesigning the front end of our site. You can see our homepage now right here, but make sure to come back in about a year's time to see our updated website as well. Hi everyone, my name is Emma Thompson again. Um, I work on the Digital Scriptorium Project, which is a consortium of American libraries and museums committed to free online access to their collections of pre-modern manuscripts. Our website and database unites scattered resources from many institutions across the US into an open platform for teaching and scholarly research. It serves to connect an international user community to multiple repositories by means of a digital catalog with sample images and searchable metadata. Our current database includes records for over 8,000 manuscripts uh, held in institutions across the country, 
accompanied by over 40,000 images. In 2020, DS received funding from the IMLS to begin planning for its redevelopment into the National Union Catalog of Premodern Manuscripts in the US. This redevelopment project, which we call DS 2.0, will also see Digital Scriptorium expand its geographic scope to include manuscripts produced anywhere around the globe, rather than its current focus mainly on Western European materials. You can learn more about our grant project on our website, where you can also search and browse the catalog and learn more about our member institutions and our current grant project. Founded in 2013, the Digital Public Library of America is a national platform providing free seamless access to digitized collections from thousands of American galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. In essence, the PLA is a co collaboration of, by, and for humanities institutions to ensure their relevance and increase public access to their collections in an increasingly digital age. Now in our eighth year of operations, we have grown to encompass a diverse community of over 4,000 partners representing cultural heritage institutions, large and small across 44 states. In total, our partners have contributed more than 40 million curated digital artifacts to our shared collection at dp.la. As Director of Community Engagement, I build and promote inclusive collections and design technology to make these free resources accessible to the public through the dp.la platform. I also stewarded partnerships and curation for the Black Women's Suffrage Digital Collection. In 2019, the Digital Public Library of America launched a strategy that emphasized a commitment to empowering institutions and communities that have been historically marginalized, underserved, and underrepresented, and promoting diverse and inclusive collections and stories. As part of this work, DPLA launched the Pivotal Ventures funded Black Women's Suffrage Digital Collection, a collaborative project that provides access to over 200,000 archival materials that tell the story of the critical role Black women played and continue to play in the voting rights and civil rights movements. SAWA was founded about six years ago as a collaborative initiative aimed at providing free historical materials on South Asia to a wide audience. SAWA is administered by the Center for Research Libraries which many of you know as CRL. SAWA is a collective of leading research libraries that contribute to the project in extremely meaningful ways, from providing expertise and direction, to selecting and curating the content, to securing funding and helping SAWA reach wider audiences. SAWA currently has 27 member libraries. From the very beginning, our goal was to digitize a diverse range of content for researchers across the world. Now, Sawa's curated open access collections total over 800,000 images and can continue to grow. Next slide, please. South Asia Open Archives is a free open access research resource for research and teaching a rich and growing curated collection of key historical and contemporary sources. Sawa's collections include materials on the arts, humanities and social sciences from and about South Asia in English and other languages throughout the region. Sawa's collection uh, currently contains over 26,000 items comprising books, journals, newspapers, census data, magazines, and government documents, with a particular focus on social and economic history, literature, women and gender, and caste and social structure. Sawa's collections are hosted on JSTOR Forum, a state-of-the-art platform for open access collections, which JSTOR calls community collections. Sawa was the first project to adopt JSTOR Forum and has helped pave the way for several open access collections. So the first questions we're going to answer today have to deal with governance. What is unique about your governance structure? How does your governance structure foster effective, equitable, and efficient decision-making? 
At DS, we're a 5013C nonprofit governed by a president and an executive director, a seven member board of directors and a seven member advisory council. The board meets virtually once a month and one annual meeting is held each year attended by institutional representatives from each member as well as any other interested parties. Each member has one official representative. Membership in DS is comprised of two levels, voting members who pay dues to participate in DS and may vote on board elections and new membership applications, and non-voting members called associate members who do not pay membership fees to participate, but also do not get to vote on DS policies. A major challenge in our governance structure is communication between the DS administrators and member institutions. Despite having an assigned member rep for each institution, things like staffing changes and collection acquisitions and DS sessions and other changes are often not communicated by institutions back to DS. So our data on the website quickly becomes out of date. And one of the goals of our DS 2.0 redevelopment project is to establish a regular communication avenue and a data ingest process from members into the DS database. CEDL is governed by a working group made up of stakeholders from our consortium and our host institution. As I mentioned earlier, my position is newly created and I, along with my working group members, are actually still exploring different ways of managing this cooperative project. So while I don't have a finalized governance structure I can comment on, I can share some of the lessons I've learned while building that structure. Ultimately, transparency and communication are key to equitable participation. That might sound obvious, but when you work for a consortium, you're reporting to dozens of different stakeholders. You're defending your project, proving that it's worth the investment to multiple institutions, <clears throat> each with their own opinions and priorities. The reality of a cooperative project is that not everyone will be able to have a hand in every decision, but in order to maintain buy-in from such dispersed partners, it's critical to create an environment where everyone is listened to. On a suggestion from Neil, actually, I introduced quarterly emailed reports as an additional opportunity for members to provide formal feedback. I'm also conducting a confidential listening tour throughout our consortium to better understand everyone's needs and concerns. So our governance is still a work in progress, but I'm doing my best now to create a future for inclusive decision making in CEDL. SAWA is led by an elected, an elected executive board, which is a standing committee of the South Asia Materials Project, also called SAMP. The SAWA executive board consists of three representatives elected by the SAWA membership, each with a term of three years in a staggered rotation. Additionally, the current chair of the South Asia Materials Project and a representative from the Center for Research Libraries serve as ex officio members of the SAWA Executive Board. SAWA is governed by a five-year strategic plan. The current version of the strategic plan describes SAWA's vision and strategy for FY21 through FY25, establishing the short and long-term goals related to governance and administration, membership, collection building, infrastructure, funding, and budget. SAWA's unique governance structure is designed to foster inclusive participation and informed decision-making. Each member of the executive board also serves as chair for one of the working groups on content curation, infrastructure, funding, and outreach. For example, the content curation working group selects items for digitization proposals, which are voted on by the executive board. Additionally, the infrastructure working group recommends changes to SAWA's digitization guidelines. As you can see, SAWA's governance is contingent on active and ongoing involvement from its members. The DPLA is a nonprofit organization led by a board and executive director. 
DPLA's partners provide metadata about their digitized collections, which is combined to form the DPLA aggregate collection. Partners range from small rural historical societies to the largest academic and national collections. Most contribute data through a DPLA service or content hub. Service hubs aggregate materials within a state or region, each working typically with several hundred contributing institutions. 34 service hubs currently cover 44 states in the District Columbia of Columbia with work in progress in the remaining states. Content hubs are institutions such as Harvard University, the Library of Congress, the National Archives and Records Administration, New York Public Library, the Smithsonian Institution, and others that directly contribute to a large set of their own data. These various organizations of hubs, including staffing, funding, technical capacity, and governance, makes finding solutions for a diverse group of partners challenging. However, partners work more effectively together to achieve our common goals in the digital space through DPLA's membership governance structure. Members feel a sense of ownership and experience a place to solve shared problems through their participation in the Network Council, which includes a representative and alternate from each hub, the Advisory Council, which is a smaller uh, group of about eight individuals who are charged with ideation and strategy, and three working groups, including a Write Statements working group, Outreach and Assessment working group, and a Metadata working group. Our next topic is resource sharing. What benefits does your project gain from a cooperative model compared to a traditional digital archive? This topic is especially important for area studies archives. Cornell has an internationally significant Southeast Asia collection, yet here, just like anywhere else, these materials must jockey with the many other institutional priorities for digitization before they can be made available online. This challenge is even greater for our consortial members whose Southeast Asia collections are much smaller than ours. But our cooperative model creates an environment where items from these marginalized communities are always prioritized for digitization. And when a Southeast Asia collection is digitized at its home library, those digital materials can become incredibly siloed within those websites. By aggregating collections in CEDL, users don't need to search 17 different library catalogs to find similar resources. Instead, they can explore our single platform to locate items that would otherwise be disconnected and scattered from each other. I'd like to share a bit about the development of the Black Women's Suffrage Collection as an example of the benefits of DPLA's cooperative model and resource sharing. The collection was designed to give access to the materials in such a way that the stories speak for themselves without appropriate appropriation or colonization. A huge part of this work uh, was ensuring that collections were well described, records were labeled with full names, dates, places, and organizations these women were involved in, and the names of these partners in the struggle, all of which make um, them more discoverable in the DP.LA corpus and provides reliable information about under-resourced women on the separate site. DPLA's network of librarians and archivists committed to working with its partners at the hub levels to assess and update descriptions that are harmful and help users better understand difficult content that might be found in the collection that pulls from DPLA's larger, larger art aggregation and includes the digitization of new collections. During our query cleanup for the Black Women's Suffrage Digital Collection, the DPLA Metadata Working Group became inspired to author a statement on potentially harmful language for topical collections and the larger network, which opened up a dialogue between users and librarians and shares information about how we catalog records and what we'd like to do to change um, the harmful content that users see in our collection. Our most recent projects highlight how we utilize technical skills and collaborate with a broad network of partners to maximize impact and to demonstrate care for collections. We believe that the potential impact of this work is much larger, larger than simply curating one-off collections. 
At DS, we're dedicated to pre-modern manuscripts, which are unique historical witnesses to the cultures that produced them and are key pieces of evidence used in the study of global history. However, because they are book objects, to access their records, users must often navigate general library catalogs, which can be really difficult because manuscripts uh, often have unique shelf marks and cataloging record structures. What's more, every institution catalogs their manuscripts slightly differently. So to research manuscripts held at different institutions, users need to understand the policies at each, institu each institution, which is often very opaque. So when an institution participates in DS, they eliminate all of these access barriers. Users can come to the website and quickly pull up records for every manuscript held at an institution and then follow links to get back to the original institutional record if needed. Because of our sliding fee structure, which I'll speak about more in a minute, small institutions who don't even have a public catalog can participate in DS and make their material discoverable. And larger institutions also benefit from the increased discoverability of their collections, which can point users directly back to their own records and websites. The foundation of SAWA is interinstitutional collaboration. SAWA derives great benefit from resource sharing. SAWA's collections are sourced by its members and partners worldwide. Additionally, SAWA draws heavily on the subject matter and technical expertise of its member representatives in order to make informed decisions on all aspects of the project. SAWA also leverages the vast networks of its members and partners. I'd like to highlight a few examples of how SAWA's resource sharing has benefited the research community. First, uh, we obtained a digital collection of South Asian literature from the University of Virginia as in-kind membership contributions. Two, SAWA's partner, the American Institute for Sri Lankan Studies, helped to secure and digitize newspapers held locally in Sri Lanka. Three, when JSTOR was developing its user interface for the community collections, we engaged the SAWA membership in providing feedback during the user testing phase. And four, SAWA digitized the Bombay presidency reports covering a wide range of areas such as trade and navigation, commerce and administration. These reports were sourced from and digitized by our member, Roja Mutaya Research Library in Chennai. Please note that in the metadata for SAWA's digital objects, we acknowledge the critical contributions of our members and partners. I hope these examples illustrate the immense value of resource sharing in digital projects. Next, each of us will share how our cooperative uh, models are funded. Some of the questions that we'll answer which speak to our capacity building and ongoing sustainability include how is your cooperative project funded? What are the challenges and benefits of the structure? How do you advocate for capacity building funds such as pre-digitization support, personnel and technology or infrastructure beyond those for digitization? How do we all navigate financial precarity and how do our organizations approach grants versus ongoing membership contributions? DPLA was formed as an independent 501c3 and has received funding from public and private foundations, including IMLS, NEH, Sloan Foundation, Knight Foundation, Mellon Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, and Pivotal Ventures, which have totaled upwards of $13 million to support large partnerships that include subgranting. DPLA is also funded by a membership program engaging the current hubs. Fees are $10,000 a year for single states and $12,500 a year for multi-state hubs. Membership dollars continue to be a significant contribution to the overall sustainability of DPLA and the continued work with our community partners. The lessons we've learned from supporting partnerships for the Black Women's Suffrage Project uh, include advocating for more capacity building projects for some of our smaller partners. 
These takeaways have informed the strategy for an upcoming program called the Digital Equity Project for Advancing Racial Justice in American Archives with three main elements for subgranting. It includes building a model, digital capacity building projects, and an algorithmic justice project. The work outlined responds to DPLA's partners for requests, partners' requests for supporting, cultivating reciprocal relationships, and sharing their technical capacity with underrepresented communities, and in turn, um, operationalize, operationalizing them and increasing their tech, technical expertise and capacity to share materials. CEDAW has historically been funded almost exclusively by large grants, the money from which went mostly into collections building. This has resulted in flurries of digitization and some really excellent content, but it was always inevitably followed by droughts of stagnation once funding ran out. The creation of my position was a response to this precarity. Rather than pouring all funds into digitization, the consortium is creating sustainability through an investment in personnel, a project manager, myself, and a web developer, my colleague, Annie. While we have guaranteed funding now, we're building a solid foundation for CEDL that will keep the project viable in the long run, much more so than would be accomplished by simply adding new collections alone. Our work includes outreach and promotion, writing policies for governance and securing future funding, database remediation, improving our information architecture, and that's all on top of our migration to a redesigned platform. Not all projects have the benefit of reliable funding, but at CEDL, we're investing what we do have to decrease that precarity of soft money. At DS, our membership dues are calculated according to a weighted fee schedule that assigns scores for each institution based on three parameters. And those are their materials budget, the total size of their student body, and the number of manuscripts in their collection. The system means that DS requires no annual fee from about a third of our participating institutions. Although those that do not pay dues are associate members and don't have voting privileges. 100% of the total annual membership fees are applied to the cost of hosting and managing the DS catalog and website. So this means that DS has historically had no paid staff and all of the work up until 2020 was done by volunteers. My position as project manager has been funded by the IMLS for the past year. And part of our redevelopment work for DS 2.0 is to revise our funding structure to continue to support project management into the future. We were able to fundraise a significant amount of money this year to continue supporting our redevelopment work as we apply for the next round of grants. And this was possible due to wealthier institutions of our consortium contributing extra money to the project for the upcoming year. DS has not changed its fee structure since 2013, and it's clear that we need to increase dues in order to support the project in the future. Relying on grant funding is just not sustainable for us. SAWA is largely funded through its membership contributions to fund digitization projects, the technical infrastructure, and the program manager's salary. SAWA's inclusive membership model contains three categories in order, in order to attract and retain a wide array of members with varying levels of resources and commitments to South Asian studies. All SAWA members from every membership category have the same membership benefits. I should note that SAWA's membership runs on a five-year cycle and the annual membership contributions are financial and or in kind, for example, to providing digital content or staff time. We are continually recruiting new members, so please feel free to reach out to me if you or a colleague may be interested in learning about SAWA's inclusive membership model. During the pandemic, SAWA was able to secure 100% membership renewal 
and even add one new member. This speaks volumes to the importance of SAWA as an open access resource during such a critical period. I'd like to give a special member, sorry, I'd like to give a special mention to the National Resource Centers on various campuses for also supporting this initiative. Again, we're incredibly grateful for the continued and generous support of our network of members and partners. Now let's turn our attention to quality assurance. Specifically, how do you maintain quality in your digital archive while working with multiple partners and institutions? I'll start with Sawa. Because Sawa's materials are sourced from a variety of institutions worldwide and are digitized through various vendors, it's essential to maintain a consistent digital work product. Led by the Infrastructure Working Group, Sawa drafted its digitization guidelines, which are publicly available on Sawa's webpage. These guidelines cover areas such as metadata, file types, image capture, such as resolution and compression, image quality, file naming, folder organization, and file transfer. Moreover, Sawa's detailed documentation has been essential to establishing and strengthening our workflows and processes throughout all phases of the project. As the program manager, I've been deeply involved in quality control and cannot emphasize enough the importance of maintaining these high standards across our collections. Seedal works a great deal with partners in Southeast Asia, as well as different institutions throughout the US to generate our metadata. All of these partners have varying levels of comfort and experience with creating bibliographic description. Sometimes they're not librarians. This presents the challenge of creating descriptions that best utilize the subject and cultural knowledge of our partners while meeting the schema standards CEDL must adhere to in order to be searchable and usable. Metadata is not an intuitive concept. And so it's important to explain exactly what it is and how it will enable users to find and make sense of our materials. We make a data dictionary for each collection that defines our fields and explains exactly how to derive that information from each item. I also create a prototype record before an entire collection is described to confirm that once the data are standardized, they still highlight what the partner sees to be important about that item. I'm not from Southeast Asia, nor am I a Southeast Asianist. So the most important part of this process for me is that I don't inadvertently erase an integral part of an item's description by trying to force it into Western-centric standards. That's only possible by approaching these partnerships with cultural humility and a recognition of the gaps in my own knowledge. In the end, maintaining quality while working with dozens of partners is still less of a challenge than trying to accomplish all of this work with the help of only one institution. The quality of metadata available through the DPLA search portal, API, and other uses such as our Wikimedia Commons project is directly proportional to the quality of metadata we gather from partnering hubs. The Metadata Working Group is charged with reviewing the DPLA metadata application profile on a regular basis and deciding on the need for updates or revisions, evaluating the need for developing metadata quality guidelines, documentation, and training to improve the quality, periodically reviewing and analyzing metadata in DPLA with the goal of providing information back to partners and for the planning and implementation of data quality improvement initiatives and then undertaking those initiatives to promote and facilitate the use of DPLA metadata. The current DS database is built with a very idiosyncratic and nested data model that member institutions must crosswalk their records against before ingestion into the DS database. This is a very complicated and time-consuming process and it's often resulted in members contributing data once and then never updating or contributing again. 
with our DS 2.0 project, we've rewritten our data model to be much simpler. And we've applied linked open data practices to focus on harvesting authority controlled data that can be managed much easier. With dedicated staffing, we can now take over the crosswalk process from the institutions, removing a barrier that hindered regular updates. We've also eliminated data fields that apply only to Western European manuscripts. And we've adopted Wikibase as our database platform in order to better store data in scripts from across the globe. Thank you for your attention today, everyone. If you have any questions that we were not able to address in the chat, please feel free to reach out to us after this session.